Uh, good afternoon to those of you joining us here in Bonn, and good morning, afternoon or evening to those of you joining us online. My name is Aaron Taki. I'm a project leader in the Nordic Working Group for Climate and Air under the auspices of the Council of Ministers, and I will be the moderator for this event titled Gender Focus in Nordic Climate Policies, Carbon Market Mechanisms and Energy Access Initiatives, which is jointly hosted by the Nordic Council of Ministers and NEFCO. I will shortly introduce you to our esteemed panel, but first, some background to this event. As many of you may be aware, at COP25 in Madrid in 2009, the parties to the UNFCCC adopted a five-year enhanced female work program on gender and a gender action plan. The gender action plan sets out five priority areas that aim to advance knowledge on an understanding of gender responsive climate action and its coherent mainstreaming in the implementation of the UNFCCC. It covers the work of parties, the secretariats, United Nations entities, entities, and all stakeholders at all levels, and aims at guaranteeing, guaranteeing women's full, equal, and meaningful participation in the UNFCCC process. Both the Nordic Council of Ministers and NEFCO have taken steps towards gender mainstreaming in their climate work. At the UN Commission on the Status of Women, CSW 66, in New York in March this year, the Nordic Ministers for Gender Equality and LGBTI committed to promote international cooperation, alliances and advocacy on the interconnections between climate action and gender equality, and to develop and share knowledge as well as internally committing to advance gender mainstreaming within green transition initiatives throughout the organisation. NEFCO launched its gender policy in 2018 and conducts gender assessments for all programs and projects it finances, supporting awareness raising about the importance of gender equality among all its clients. NEFCO also manages the Beyond the Grid Fund for Africa program, whose awardees are required to offer equal opportunities for men and women and demonstrate their gender mainstreaming across the organisational governance structure through mandating a gender policy and gender action plan for all Beyond the Grid Fund for Africa pro financed projects. On behalf of the Nordic Council of Ministers and NEFCO, I look forward to discussing with you all at this event the next steps to integrate gender in climate policies, carbon market mechanisms and energy access programs. Please allow me to introduce our panel. Firstly, Oris Tinkinen, Senior Advisor at the Finnish Innovation Fund Citra and partner at Tiski Consulting. Amongst other work, Oris recently co-authored the report Equality in the Climate Crisis, How Finland Can Promote Gender Equality in International Climate Policy, commissioned by Plan International Finland. Sara Trerup, Head of Section in Technology Transitions and System Innovation at the UNEP Copenhagen Climate Centre. Sara works with international organisations and national governments in developing countries to promote the development, transfer and use of environmentally sound technologies and will reflect upon gender integration in UNEP's work. Our next speaker is joining us online, Hanna Mari Ahonen, Senior Consultant at Perspective Climates, Perspectives Climate Group. Hanna Mari has worked for both the Swedish and Finnish governments and NEFCO in climate related work. I thought she might appear on the screen there for a second. Perhaps we could get a little hello if she is available. Hannah Mari helped develop gender considerations in the Nordic Initiative for Cooperative Approaches uh, in the Principles for Article 6 Cooperation. <coughs> Next, Russell Lysight, also joining us online, Managing Director at Vitalite Zambia Limited. Vitalite is a company selling, selling solar home systems to off-grid rural areas with some 40,000 energy service subscriptions in Zambia. Great to see them both online with us. The company is a recent awardee of the Beyond the Grid Fund for Africa program, and Russell will discuss the challenges of practical implementation of gender aspects in energy access programs in Vitalite's work. I've missed Axel, haven't I? I apologize, Axel. <laughs> Axel was actually speaking before Hannah Murray, but Axel Eriksson is the youth delegate to the UNFCCC for Sweden. Axel is one of two youth delegates from Sweden uh, who throughout national level youth dialogue, dialogues consolidated youth views and visions for the UNFCCC, uh, both negotiations and process, and will reflect upon gender, gender integration in Nordic climate work representing the 
uh, representing the youth civil society in Sweden. And then our last speaker, Erica Lennon, is senior attorney at the Climate and Energy Program for the Climate and Energy Program at the Center for International Environmental Law in the USA. Erica will discuss gender considerations in the Green Climate Fund and Article 6 and reflect upon Nordic approaches within an international context. They are our six speakers for the event. We will first start with opening remarks where each speaker will have five minutes to present a bit of their work and reflect upon the topic in the whole. We will then move into discussion questions and then after that we will have the opportunity for, speak, uh, for members of the audience and on the digital online platform to ask questions. So I look forward to discussing this with you over the next hour and a half or now a bit less than so. And I would like to give the word firstly to Oris to start us off in our panel discussion. Welcome, Oris. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, you will soon hear from very knowledgeable people that uh, Aaron just introduced. So um, uh, my role, uh, luckily, will be to provide a bit of an overview or an introduction to the topic today and then uh, let the smarter people dive deeper into the topic. In the study Aaron uh, mentioned already, uh, my colleagues and I looked at uh, the intersections of gender equality and international climate policy from a number of perspectives. And quite firstly, uh, um, I think if you try to paint the big picture of these intersections, you quite soon realize, and this will not come as a surprise to this uh, audience, uh, most probably that gender, climate and international affairs are all in their own right rather broad and diverse fields. And when you try to make the connections between these broad and diverse fields, the picture gets quite complex. So it is perhaps not so surprising that these linkages are not often made and they, they may be neglected. Another thing we realized very quickly when we were working on that report was that these communities are in quite many cases quite siloed and they have their own discussions fairly remote from each other. So if I may uh, perhaps make a bit of an exaggeration here, the climate people, so to say, don't necessarily talk to the gender people and vice versa. And this makes um, uh, getting this integrated understanding and dialogue uh, uh, a bit more challenging. Now, the second thing we did in the report was to look at the evolution of uh, integrating gender equality into the international climate treaties and, and negotiations. And uh, you could, I think it's safe to say, uh, argue that for a long time gender did not play a very significant role in this setting. Then over the years we've seen uh, a bit of progress starting from uh, the turn of the millennium and then more importantly in the 2010s. Uh, Aaron already mentioned the, um, the extension of the Lima uh, uh, work program that was really a turning point from the institutional perspective that really helped in uh, integrating gender equality concerns into the, uh, the no negotiations under the UNFCCC. But if you look at how gender is addressed uh, in international climate negotiations, uh, I think that is a fairly narrow way to look at it. Uh, firstly, uh, much of the, the uh, focus is on women and it's uh, more specifically on the representation of women in negotiations. And as important as that is, it is still a fairly narrow take on what gender equality means from the point of view of international climate policy. And in the report we would argue that to understand the broader picture you would have to go beyond just looking at women and the representation of women uh, to understanding gender more broadly, including looking at the role of men uh, in uh, promoting gender equality, as well as understanding gender diversity and uh, having a more intersectional take on, 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 on gender and equality that uh, takes into account these intersecting differences that often can play a very uh, important role. Then third, uh, we looked at some cases of, of how countries have tried to integrate gender considerations into their international climate policy. And looking at the case of Finland, uh, you can say that Finland has arguably been a fairly active advocate of integrating gender concerns into climate uh, negotiations, uh, including the Paris Agreement. Uh, Finland has also for years quite consistently supported uh, uh, the, uh, the participation of women ne negotiators from the Global South and their training uh, so that they would have a more uh, uh, effective role in, in shaping what the, the negotiations are, 
uh, do and achieve. However, again, there uh, you could argue that uh, these activities have by and large been project-based, underfinanced and quite disorganized. So there hasn't been a very consistent approach to uh, involving uh, in in integrating gender equality into uh, international climate policies. Uh, also, Finland has had a tradition of having a fairly development cooperation uh, based approach. So understanding what uh, uh, the importance of gender when it comes to development cooperation. But if you look at international policy more broadly, issues such as diplomacy or trade policy, their gender considerations are, tend to be neglected. We also looked at a number of other countries, Sweden, Canada, Mexico. And here again, you, you can say that there is uh, a bit of an effort, and uh, I think uh, that deserves some credit. But there's also quite a lot of criticism about the lack of concrete measures, for instance, staying at the fairly headline level of saying uh, important things, but not necessarily doing so much. And also, again, a bit of a narrow approach to what gender equality really means from the point of view of, of climate policy. Um, finally, the report uh, made a number of recommendations on how we can improve uh, the work, uh, especially in the context of Finland, but hopefully some of these recommendations might be interesting and helpful for some other countries as well, uh, perhaps uh, uh, more so in, in the global north. Uh, but in the interest of time, I would uh, stop here and uh, uh, come back to the, to the recommendations, perhaps in the discussion. The, the report is, uh, of course, available uh, online uh, for anyone who is interested in English. Thank you, Aris. We'll now turn to Sarah to continue the discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a great pleasure being here. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation to contribute to this uh, really interesting uh, session and I'm looking forward to the discussions. I also want to say I'm, I'm not a gender expert, but I will speak about how we have approached it in, in our work with supporting close to 100 developing countries in their so-called technology needs assessment processes that are a tool for developing countries to report on their technology needs under the convention. And it's part of the work of Article 10 of the Paris Agreement and the technology mechanism um, of the UNFCCC. So we have supported these uh, 97 countries, to be exact, uh, since 2009, and we are currently active in 39 countries. Countries are based on a set of nationally decided criteria re reflecting social, economic, and environmental aspects identifying and prioritize technologies for adaptation and for mitigation. And almost all, I think we are up at the number of 90% of the countries are focusing on the energy sector as well. So they identify through national processes these key technologies that contribute for them to achieve targets set under their NDCs with inputs from this technology process. It is uh, nationally-led processes that are led by a national designated uh, focal point, a TNA coordinator, and a team of national consultants, to which we provide capacity building, and then the national team engages with stakeholders, working groups, and experts in their fields. Usually, countries focus on water and agriculture for adaptation, energy, transport, waste for mitigation. So those are sort of the key sectors they are focusing on. Just to give you a bit of background. And, and as said, we have implemented this project since uh, 2000, 2009. We have developed quite a thorough methodology also under uh, COP mandates, etc. And at some point, we also um, realized that we saw too little reflections on gender aspects in the reports countries are preparing. So back in 2018, which is not that long ago, we did prepare a, a new guidance for countries on preparing a gender responsive technology needs assessment. And related to that guidance, we also developed capacity building modules and e-learnings for the countries. And we integrated it throughout our um, methodology and the training we provide to countries. So it was not a standalone, you could say, half an hour in a three-day uh, capacity building work program, but we actually integrated it into the different sessions. 
Um, and why, why did we do that? Well, we did realize that to integrate gender aspects, it is required, resources are required, information, capacity building, that was required for us to provide that to the, to the participating countries. And why was that so? Well, we wanted the, the outputs, the results, to reflect equal opportunities for women and men going forward so that those plans and programs coming out from this project actually reflected that it provided equal opportunities for women and men to take part and to benefit from the adoption of those technologies that we are talking about in this process. We also realized that we needed to take a, a, a multiple entry points. It's not enough to provide training on how to integrate gender aspects in their work, but we also took it at the institutional level. So first of all, we wanted to at least create awareness of who are part of the um, national teams. Does that reflect uh, gender considerations? It's a challenge we experience that working on technology as we do, there is a male overrepresentation amongst the experts that are part of the field. So we wanted to create awareness of who are part of the national teams who are part of the experts involved in the process and the working groups, etc. To create awareness also so that the national teams went that step further, both in establishing a gender somehow balanced team of people working on the issue and then in their stakeholder consultations also to be aware of who are we actually uh, bringing into the consultations. So. Reflecting a bit upon, okay, what happened after we introduced this approach? And, and I also want to share with you, I, I recall very clearly one of the, we, we have regional workshops bringing together countries. And I was in a workshop in South Africa where we had uh, participation or representation from 10 different African countries. And it was the first time uh, we introduced this approach. And I remember so clearly one of the coordinators, as we call them, the focal point, stood up and said, why are you only doing this now? You know, and I had, we, we are working with a set of very different countries from West Africa, uh, from Chad, Liberia, uh, and to Tanzania and Mozambique, etc. So we are working with a very broad, um, or varied, <laughs> I would say, uh, characteristics of the countries. And I had sort of said, okay, what, what, how will this be? received and actually it was so positive and I said oh okay but okay you asked me why are we introducing this now but I'm saying why would we need to introduce it but so it was like it was a sort of a multiple oh, and very interesting discussion and I also had feedback from my colleagues who were presenting it in the Caribbean region and there actually the response was because in the way it was presented one of the participants stood up and said but this is not only about women for us, it's as much about men, so we, we need equal representation of both men and women, and I think that's also a key point to bring to the discussion. Um, so, so after uh, 2018, uh, when we introduced this approach, and with the 39 countries we are working with now, we have seen uh, going from almost zero consideration, at least explicitly, of gender aspects, Actually, 91% of the prioritization work today includes criteria uh, that reflects uh, gender aspects. So that could be who would benefit from the technology, is there equal access uh, men compared to women, but also actually youth is included in the process, etc. So from our side, bringing awareness to the issue or to the aspects, it has really raised the bar from zero to almost I'm, it's not perfect, but at least there is much more awareness uh, where we are today compared to where we were. Um, there's, we, we, earlier this year, we have also produced uh, a brief uh, going through all the work that has been done, summarizing the outcomes or status of how gender is integrated uh, in these national processes. And, and that's also a way, look, we have a, a, a TNA website, techaction.org, where the 
guidebook, the e-learning, this uh, sort of status brief, uh, they are all available. And um, I just want to say, okay, I wish we had done it, had done it earlier. We did it, and uh, it's never too late. And we actually did see a real impact of introducing this approach. And finally, before stopping, I wanted to say that it does matter. We integrate it in the prioritization of technologies in what is so-called technology action plans that then has a spillover in what is uh, lifted up to the NDC work and again to technology roadmaps and long-term strategies. And having this approach from the very early stages, we at least make an effort to ensure that the technologies put forward are gender uh, responsive and or reflecting those aspects. So I think it matters. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Soon we'll be moving to talk more about what this looks like in the fields, but we're gonna stay a bit more on the Nordic. Uh, our next speaker, Axel, will be talking about what uh, the, the, new, the Nordic or the Swedish youth perspective is on this topic uh, through your experience. So Axel, I'll give the word to you. Thank you. And uh, First of all, I would like to thank the previous two speakers for highlighting these important initiatives since uh, gender mainstreaming has always been a big priority for the at least the Swedish youth movement um, because we know how marginalized groups are disproportionately affected by um, climate change and therefore um, gender needs to be mainstreamed in climate policies. So I would like to highlight three priorities, uh, at least. The first one is intersectionality. The second one is uh, increasing reporting of funding for uh, international projects. And the third one is increasing the number of projects with genders as a significant um, purpose. So, to start with the first one, intersectionality. This means that it, doesn't, it isn't enough to just consider gender in isolation. What needs to be considered is uh, not that, for example, women instead of men are involved. You also have to ask, what women? Is it those who are already privileged and less affected? Or is it those who actually are on the front lines? Um, and the second point, increasing the reporting. That stems from uh, a study made by uh, an alliance of uh, churches in, in the Nordics who investigated how international funding from the Nordic countries um, went to gender. And uh, in relation to this, uh, there is actually no mandatory reporting to the UNFCCC uh, how much of the international climate financing goes towards gender. Um, so, for example, Sweden has taken the voluntary initiative to actually report to the UNFCCC. But I want to stress that word, voluntary. Um, because what we youth advocate is for this to be mandatory. And until then, um, I argue that the Nordic countries need to do this voluntary reporting, uh, since otherwise we can't uh, see what financing actually goes towards gender mainstream projects. Um, and the Nordic countries should also advocate for the UNFCCC to adopt a mandatory reporting framework. And the third aspect is having gender as a significant uh, purpose in more uh, project funding. So today uh, the Nordic countries report uh, about, uh, I think it was 41 percent or yeah, along those lines, about half of their projects have gender as either a principal objective or as a significant objective, 
Whereas, for example, in Sweden, who has since 2014 a feminist foreign aid policy, has increased that um, share to 81%. And therefore, the other Nordic countries also need to step up together and uh, make sure that more projects are actually um, have gender as a significant objective. Um, so to conclude, we need intersectionality, increased reporting, and uh, having gender as a significant objective. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. I was going to ask for some concrete suggestions as one of our discussion questions, but we've already uh, kick-started that discussion, so that's great, Axel, and very concise message there. So now we'll turn to the digital space, and hopefully Hannah Murray is able to uh, come up on the screen, and maybe we'll just test that you are connected. Maybe you can say hello. Hello. Okay, that sounds good here in Bonn. I hope you can hear it as well on the live stream. So Hannah Murray, I'll hand over the word to you. Thank you, Aaron. So hello from Helsinki. Um, I'm Hannah Maria Honen, and I'll be speaking about gender equality in the context of the carbon markets. So I've been working with the Nordic uh, governments on, on carbon market issues for a long time. And also happy to report that Nordics have been bringing the gender consideration from general climate cooperation also into the space of carbon markets. Um, for for a long time, so they've been pioneering that uh, that space. And really, carbon markets, there's a lot of mystification around them, as there is with um, gender equality issues. Um, but basically, carbon markets are a source of finance for projects and programs that can be to it, um, it be about energy or transport or waste. So all of the different um, sectors that we already mentioned by Sarah. So. Um, that means that the policies and the approaches and the tools that are generally used for gender considerations in projects and programs can also be applied in carbon market projects because there are the same kind of underlying projects there. And so actually already uh, in 2010, the Finnish foreign ministry commissioned a study about uh, the clean development mechanism and um, its potential gender co-benefits. And that was one of the early studies on, on how these things link. Um, and they, they looked at different types of uh, project activities and sectors and developed a gender spectacles tool to really look at the, the project that we're used to working on with gender spectacles on. Um, so that was a, an early contribution by the Nordics to this discussion. And I was part of uh, writing that report and that really demystified the topic for me myself as well. And what really helped as well was that we apply the gender spectacles tool to a concrete project, a uh, solar cooker project in China, which was part of the Finnish government's um, portfolio. And so we visited the, the project uh, beneficiaries and interviewed the people there to understand how that project is affecting them. And we were interviewing men and women and did realize that they have very different benefits from the same project, which is also very interesting. And when we were asking about what the benefits were, the men were highlighting that they saved money um, and saved a lot of time by not having to go and buy the coal and walk for 60 kilometers to carry the coal, whereas then the women saved the time at home and, and didn't have to be in the smoke anymore. And both of them were highlighting that the saved money could then be used for education, for example, for both girls and boys. But it was really interesting to hear what the project did for um, different uh, people in the families, for example. And that really demystifies what it's about. Um, and then if we look at par um, Paris Agreement's Article 6, which is the rules for carbon market cooperation under the article um, and under the Paris Agreement, it specifically requires that parties that participating carbon markets under the Paris Agreement consider gender equality and women's empowerment. And this hasn't been there before, but now it's an actual requirement for Article 6 cooperation. So it's a great opportunity to make use of the existing tools and bring them in the space of carbon market projects as well. And one thing that is 
being done at the Nordic level is the Nordic Initiative for Cooperative Approaches, which is a space for discussing Article 6 cooperation among the Nordics and piloting what do these principles mean in practice. Um, so there's going to be some piloting activities under the this NICA initiative. And one of the things that we've been developing together with NICA is a framework for Nordic Article 6 cooperation that lists the kind of priorities and principles how the Nordics want to do Article 6 cooperation or carbon market cooperation. And gender has been highlighted as a specific Nordic priority. So using carbon market pilot activities to really also pilot what does it mean to promote gender equality through these projects. And here uh, we are recommending or the, the framework recommends that we make use of everything that the Nordics have been working on gender um, responsive and gender transformation, transformative um, approaches and tools and apply them also for the carbon market cooperation. So we have the NEFCO policy, we have the NDF policies. There's also a really interesting experience from the Energy and Environment Partnership for Africa, which is a Finnish funded um, climate finance type or energy finance type um, activity. And they have a lot of experience with looking at gender aspects and finding things like um, the benefits of gender considerations throughout the design and also throughout implementation. And so there are some tools, but there is a limited amount of tools. There's also a standard for bringing gender aspects into carbon market uh, projects or other types of projects as well, called the W plus standard. It's been around for a while. It hasn't been very widely applied yet to my understanding, but it would be a great opportunity to use the Nordic Article 6 pilots and then use this to really highlight what does it mean in the, in the context of, of real projects on the ground. And so we are really hoping that the pilots with their actual projects would start to demonstrate and demystify what this means in practice. Um, and one important thing is that it helps to um, monitor and report and verify actual indicators related to these projects. And even if it's a process and it's not perfect, um, it's really important that we start learning by doing or continue learning by doing and also bringing from those other silos that Oras was talking about into the carbon market silo, uh, the same experiences and, and um, learning together. So um, with that, I would like to pass on back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah Marie. We're going to stay in the digital space a bit more and I want to just check that Russell, if you are with us, if you could test your sound. Say hello, perhaps. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. That's fantastic, Russell. So, Great. Russell, you'll be telling us a bit more about what this looks like in practice and on the field. So, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. The word is yours. Sure, thank you. Thank you. It's, um, it's really exciting to be involved in this sort of practical discussion of what is such an important uh, topic. Let me just start by explaining a little bit about Vitalite just to help the audience, I guess, situate what I'm about to say. So the organization was founded in 2013. Uh, we've got a primary focus on solar home systems and clean cooking, so mainly in the um, high efficiency cookstove space. And um, we're based here in Lusaka and we've got a specific focus on Zambia. Um, I joined Vitalite partway through 2018 in a kind of small project role uh, and grew to the MD role at the beginning of January 2020. And just for a bit of context, um, our board is 100% male. Our management team is 40% uh, female. Um, the sales team, the operations team, the IT team and the marketing team are all led by women in our organization. Of our 140 staff, 43% uh, are women. Of our 600 agents, 23% uh, are women. And of our approximately 50,000 solar home system customers, about 30% are women. So just to kind of give a flavor of the uh, the way that we've been operating and, and where we are at the moment. Um, I, I had a background in financial services. I'm from London. I moved to Zambia in 2012. And as I said, started with uh, Vitalite in 2018. And um, what I found originally was, I guess, quite reflective of the wider corporate culture here. So reasonably top down, quite highly centralized, quite highly patriarchal. And I was very keen to change that culture and shift to a more bottom-up, decentralized, more gender-balanced uh, environment. 
Um, as was mentioned earlier, we are uh, investees with uh, Beyond the Grid Fund Africa. We were previously with Beyond the Grid Fund Zambia, which is a program that um, kind of kicked off this wider Beyond the Grid Fund program. And I'm definitely of the view that tying our performance in results-based financing terms uh, with milestones that relate to, for example, uh, gender action plans to the satisfaction of NEFCO. I think I'm broadly quoting from our current contract with NEFCO. Um, having that sort of um, encouragement, having that sort of focus is vital. Um, tying the funding together with performance really does help uh, get the minds of our senior management team um, uh, focused on these sorts of issues. Although, of course, um, whether people do that work from a ticking of the box perspective or whether they do it because they truly believe it's the right thing to do are two uh, different things. Um, I have the view that uh, gender equality and gender balance are, um, well, it's one of those subjects that's got the happy circumstance of being both the right thing to do and I think the commercially focused right thing to do as well, if that makes sense. And I think about it through three lenses. So one of them is to do with customers. Uh, we want to make sure that we are aligning what we offer to the needs of our communities. So in doing that, we've got to make sure that we understand the unmet needs of men and women, which are sometimes different or they can be expressed in different ways. And we need to align our portfolio of products to meet those needs. But we also need to do things like work with our product designers uh, and our, our, our suppliers to make sure that they understand some of the gender differences that they might need to be considering in, even at the design stage. So um, uh, that's, that's one aspect of how I think about things in terms of the customer. Another aspect of how I think about things is in terms of our teams, which I kind of split into two. So if I think about it from the perspective of what I'm really here to do, I think I'm really here to create an environment in which people can do their absolute best and then to hire the best people I can possibly afford and give them the opportunity to be held fully accountable for what they're asked to do. Now, if we present ourselves to the employment market in a way that discourages half the population, then clearly I don't have much of a chance of uh, hiring the best possible talent because half the pool of talent, in theoretical terms at least, are going to be put off by what I'm saying. If, let's say, we've been gender balanced in our approach to recruitment, but we've then brought um, these team members into now into our organization and they have experiences inside the organization that discourage them because they're women and they're being treated poorly because of that then again I'm definitely not going to be getting the best out of them so it's absolutely vital to me that we both present ourselves to the market in a, in a gender balanced way and that we have a culture internally that makes sure that um, women and men, and there are obviously other forms of discrimination, but we've been talking about women and men today, that women and men feel equally um, capable of doing their absolute best. Now, just to give you a flavor of um, the, the context into which I'd arrived, some of the sorts of anecdotal comments I would hear were things like, well, we can't hire a woman to do that role because women don't understand technical things. We can't put a woman into that particular role because in a crisis, women are not as good as decision making, at decision making as men, which is that kind of old, uh, kind of women are too emotional uh, trope, which I, I think many of us will recall Hillary Clinton suffered as part of her um, presidential campaign. Um, I've heard things like women are not capable of handling machinery because they're not strong enough. They're not able to ride a motorcycle for the same reason. Even things like, well, if I hire a woman, then she's just gonna cause any problems. Maternity leave, Mother's Day, these sorts of things. So. Yes, it's vital that we've got um, ties, direct links to programs like Beyond the Grid Fund Africa that encourage us to do our best in this space. But it's also important to, re to, or to recognize that the delivery of what's required to do our best in this space is situated in these sorts of environments. Now, I can only speak for Zambia. Clearly, I can't speak directly with first-hand experience of what it's like in other countries, uh, either here in Africa or uh, elsewhere other than the UK where I've spent most of my career. But these are the sorts of things that we've typically uh, faced. Um, and again, just to kind of reinforce, I do believe that what gets measured gets managed. So the sorts of uh, gender specific milestones that an external body like Beyond the Good Fund would want us to take on, I like to see those reflected in the performance uh, plans 
of my team leaders to make sure that that um, there's an alignment between what we're expected to do uh, from the from an external perspective and what I expect uh, my team members uh, to do. Um, and I guess I wanted to touch in particular on this question of culture and leadership. Um, I've seen too many examples, and it's not just within the company that I work within now, but elsewhere. I've seen too many examples of um, what you might call lip service being paid to um, policies or procedures that are intended to ensure gender equity. So if I was to give one uh, example under Chatham House rules, I'd come across an occasion when a sales team leader was accused of sexual harassment. And at least, at the, at least from the perspective of there being a conversation that was had with this individual, you might think that um, things were about to be taken seriously. But unfortunately, the decision that was made was to, sim to simply move this individual away geographically from the person that they had been harassing and put them somewhere else in the same organization. Now, that's the sort of thing which anybody internally who's looking at that from a gender balance perspective is going to be horrified by. But these are some of the things that do go on. So I do think that um, it's, it's, it's vital that whoever is in the leadership position ensures that all of these policies that we put together that look so great on paper are actually followed through in practice and that um, and that that's done in a highly visible way so just to give one example of that um, there are there have been occasions when I've been interviewing with a panel alongside me and when I've asked a question I get an I get a response from the interviewee that is so gender imbalanced I can be confident that this is not an individual I want our organization to employ. And I simply end the interview there and then. These are the sorts of things that as an interviewee, I think that person can see that this is a subject I take seriously. In terms of the panel that's sitting alongside me who are other members of staff, they can see that this is a subject that I take seriously. So these are the sorts of things which um, I think can sometimes be tough. They can sometimes make it an uncomfortable experience, particularly for somebody who's coming from outside of the country. I need to make sure that I'm sensitive to local cultures, but that I still push ahead to make sure that we get these sorts of things right. And not just uh, for the now, but in a kind of very sustainable uh, way. And let me pause there or end there and, and hand back to our chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, Russell. And thank you for helping us to contextualize this in some very concrete ways as you did. We'll now wrap up our panel with our final speaker, Erica, who also is welcome to give a bit of a reflection on the panel now that you've got to listen to all the speakers. I'll give the word to you. Thanks so much. Um, and, and thank you for inviting me into <clears throat> my fellow speakers. Um, it's been quite interesting to hear more about the Nordic perspective. And, and I think there's a lot of synergies between what I, I would have to say and, and the approaches that it that it appears are being taken and obviously there then has to be follow through and we'll see how um, as the future goes. But I think a lot of it is it's important to start from the basis of having it in policies and going forward um, to get a bit of a, a background. So as um, was mentioned, I'm a senior attorney at Seattle, the Center for International Environmental Law, which is an NGO that has long worked um, across um, and with many partners um, on really integrating human rights and gender equality in climate policies and in climate action, um, and, and really highlighting that the climate crisis is a human rights crisis, is a women's rights crisis. And they, yes, they are big topics, but they are intimately linked um, and integrated and have to be addressed in a holistic manner um, if we're really going to solve solve all of the problems, it all needs to be addressed together. And I think, um, as you touched on, intersectionality is, is core to that. Um, <clears throat> and what I'll start with is that really the most effective climate action is not just action that takes on and, and puts in gender as a, as a perspective, but is climate action that is people-centered, that is rights-based, that is action that is generated and women-led, that is indigenous peoples-led, that is indigenous women's-led, and that is led by local communities who are most impacted by the climate crisis. Because while women are women and indigenous women in particular and local communities and people on the front lines are some of the most impacted people, they're also the most effective actors um, for, for creating effective climate action. And I think that 
that's been recognized. That's not just me as an advocate saying that. That's been recognized by the science and by the IPCC and findings, that that's really the most effective climate action that we can see. And I think that one of the things and one of the longstanding things we've seen in the shortcomings and limits of, of things like the market mechanisms of some of the international financing um, and there is that really to invest in gender equality, it's really more effective to directly finance women and feminist groups who are implementing mitigation and adaptation activities. And it's not just about putting in gender or, or having a gender action plan alongside a project that's not really um, one that's focused on women, but also that comes from the women themselves and that really takes an approach that is, that is based on that. So it's not necessarily about having a project that is women focused, but that is women led um, is one thing I, I will say um, to add on to like it is it is wonderful to have, um, you know, on paper policies and, and it's important to have gender policies and to think these things through. But really, the next step of being transformative is to is to have more women led projects. And I think that one of the things that we can see and that I think is, it is true, there's, there's been much movement within the UNFCCC on gender integration and, and gender mainstreaming. Um, and as, as Hannah Marie mentioned, one of the things that was a key, a key ask of many across um, civil society and across the various constituencies here was to really integrate and make sure that the rules for Article 6 talked about human rights and said that Article 6 activities had to integrate human rights and had to integrate uh, gender equality and women's empowerment. And so it's very important that the rules that were adopted last year at the COP included that. And now it's about implementing that and seeing that through because it's not enough to have these policies written on paper. I think we really need to see it in the implementation um, of, of projects on the ground if we're really to achieve true gender equality. Um, and one of the one of the ways to do that and to think about that, and I think it's one of the things that really uh, some of what Russell was highlighting at the end, or in his presentation was talking about, is that you start with the plan and the goals, and you start with having a gender policy and a gender action plan, and really integrating that in climate planning and actions from the beginning. And then they have to be implemented in a transformative and intersectional manner. And it's not just about climate, and it's not just about integrating. Um, it's, and it is about thinking about which women you're inviting and, and thinking about in an intersectional way. But it's also recognizing that it's not just climate that's impacting people. It's systemic and cultural barriers that have to be addressed and power structures that have to be addressed that curtail the voice and agency of women. And if you're not addressing all of these things in a holistic manner, you're never going to really achieve the truly transformative gender equality we need to see in climate policies. And so you have to take a much more intersectional approach um, in order to do that, because that's how you're going to get true participation of people. You have to think about, if you want meaningful participation in the design of a climate project, for example, whether it's a market project or a climate finance project, for example, through the Green Climate Fund, in order to have meaningful participation, there are considerations that you have to think about when you're thinking about gender. Is it at a time that women can participate? Is it at a time when children are in school? Is there daycare available? Are you providing daycare? Is it a space where women feel free to speak up and talk? Or are there so many men in the room that they don't feel comfortable? Are women allowed to speak in spaces where there are men? And so taking into all of the, taking into consideration all of these things are are important when you're designing you know meaningful participation which is at the very root of of really making sure that you're taking and and embodying gender equality um, as as part of um, any climate project um, and I'll say that in doing that one of the things to keep in mind is making sure that gender isn't being treated as an add-on or a separate or a standalone activity. So it is important. So for example, so one of the um, other things I do is that I participate uh, quite heavily in the Green Climate Fund as an active observer. And the Green Climate Fund has a gender mandate. It has from its beginning. 
But too often, it's seen that, yes, you know, the accredited entities have a gender policy and projects have a gender action plan, but either they don't go far enough or they're not implemented or their action plan is, is really not good enough or it's just treated as like, okay, we did a gender action plan, now here's the project. And it really can't be that gender is a standalone issue. Um, it needs to be supported throughout. And I think um, this was mentioned early on in the presentation about making sure you have in place the financing to do the gender studies and to look at um, how your um, how it's being designed and developed in a way um, that is going to benefit women. Um, and so I think uh, I think that a lot of what we've heard here about gender mainstreaming, about intersectionality, about um, thinking about the resources and thinking about making sure there's you know equal ways for men and women to adapt, thinking about the different ways that women and men um, benefit from projects is all really core to, to achieving gender equality. And I think that one of the things um, to, to add on top of that is to really think about how um, to, to not only integrate these things in sort of existing types of projects or in existing funding, but really think about one of the ways that you, you truly achieve gender equality and gender mainstreaming is to take um, as the approach that it's, it's not necessarily sort of these, these big projects or, or things that have a gender aspect to them, but that is really coming from, from people on the ground and that is led by local communities, women's groups, feminist groups, indigenous women, et cetera, because that's the most effective climate action and that's how you're going to really um, achieve gender equality in, in climate policies and climate action and to empower um, and to empower women in their participation. And that has, to, that has to be core to climate action and it has to be core to thinking through all of the policies that are, are being put in place and discussed here. And, and to that end, it's very important to have gender balance and to make sure that delegates are, that there are many women delegates and, and that's essential um, and to training them so that they're able to participate which I think is key because you need to you need to have it in the policies, and I think that one of the things to keep in mind, or that's that's important, um, is to think about for governments like the Nordic governments who have these commitments to gender, is how they are then taking those commitments that they've made and and doing in you know bilateral actions and bringing them into the multilateral spaces, and not only striving for those things at home but making sure that the policies that are adopted um, in, in the halls of the UNFCCC, in multilateral climate finance spaces, et cetera, really embrace those because I think too often um, that's not happening and that advocacy needs to happen um, in these halls so that policies reflect them because if policies reflect them, then, they'll be, then they can be implemented and we can work on um, the sort of monitoring and reporting and verification to make sure that it's, it's followed through on. Um, so I'll stop there. Great. We'll have to continue. We're a little bit behind the schedule. I'll just move this microphone, sorry. So now we'll move into the discussion. And soon we'll have an opportunity for the audience to ask some questions. But first, a, a question from me. We've already talked quite a lot about the, the challenges, the barriers, and, and the status quo a bit. Uh, I'd be curious to ask, what are some of the, the benefits of incorporating gender aspects uh, into concrete project activities? Benefits, obviously, besides women's empowerment, perhaps flow on effects from this. And I'd like to ask this question to perhaps Hannah Murray or to Russell, if you have a comment on that. Uh, we'll try and keep it quick so we can get through a few more questions. But do either of you have a thought on that question, the benefits of incorporating gender aspects into concrete project activities? Maybe just put up your Well, maybe I can... Uh, oh, no, go for it, Anna-Marie. Mm -hmm. The word is yours. All right, then you can hear me. Yeah, maybe I'll jump in here. Briefly, um, I think it was um, whoever said that actually gender equality makes a lot of sense. So it's, it's not just the right thing to do, it's also the smart and effective thing to do. And um, there are some examples from the Energy and Environment Partnership where when you took gender considerations... Uh, as part of the activity design, you saw more effective results and better project performance. Um, 
just generally and it makes perfect sense you need to know your audience you need to have um you have to make use of the talent as, as Brussels was saying and that way you perform better and you are doing the projects to your audience it just it really makes common sense um and when you start looking at what gender equality on the ground means it just means designing the projects talking to your target audiences and hearing and really having that meaningful participation and basically they have found in some studies that it 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 turns into money it it turns into better financial performance as well and project performance and longer term and i think one important thing would to make this visible um, and that could be made visible through monitoring and reporting and of course if it's not successful then monitoring and reporting allows for improvements as well so really showing and demonstrating the benefits i think is a very good way of convincing those who maybe care more about the money to also do this because it does make sense but i i will um stop there uh thank you hannah marie russell did you want to comment to that question okay to say no Sure. No, no, I'm happy to comment. Um, Great. I, I guess the, the main thing I'd say might be something of a repetition, but if you really want um, consistent outcomes in this space, then making sure that there's measurement of what you expect people to do is vital. I think I'd go one step beyond that. So let's say um, an organization is expected to have a gender action plan, as was mentioned earlier. It's all well and good having a plan, but did you implement it? Having implemented it, let's look at the uh, impact that that has had on gender from let's say a, an employment perspective and also from a customer perspective and then there can even be issues with that so for example let's say that there's an intention or an ambition to have a 60 40 split each way on your um, staffing from a gender perspective if you don't look at that from the perspective of gender as it appears at the different layers of your organization you may find that all you've got now are all of your most junior staff are women and all your most senior staff are men. So there needs to be, I think, if we're going to be making sure that we're getting outcomes from the integration of these sorts of activities into programs like BGFA, there may need to be that level of um, scrutiny, that level of monitoring uh, to make sure that the, that the outcomes that we're looking for are really being um, achieved. Yeah. Thank you, Russell. I think we have time for one comment from the panel, and we will take questions from the audience shortly. If there was one comment from the CAT panel on this question, otherwise we can move to the next one. Okay, let's keep moving ahead then. So one thing that I noticed a lot in this discussion was talking about taking action on gender in terms of representation and taking action in terms of intersectionality. And perhaps many would see representation as a, as a starting point. Uh, how many women do we have in, in boards, in, in decision-making bodies, et cetera. But I heard a number of speakers talking about the need to move towards intersectionality. I know we haven't reached all goals in many organizations about representation, as Russell also outlined uh, in a lot of um, the work you've been working with. But I'm curious to ask, and this is an open question to the panel, how do we move beyond gender, taking gender action as rep representation towards this more complex space of intersectionality? Perhaps you have some concrete suggestions. I know a few of you spoke about this, so if you would like to take the word, just put up your hand and I'll delegate the word. I mean, I, I can take it. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'll take a, a crack at it. I mean, I think it is, um, I think a few things. I think it is, it is absolutely important and vital, obviously, that, that representation is there and that, um, as, as Russell just mentioned, that it's not just, you know, yes, we have 40% of women, but they are all working at like, you know, a secretary level and everyone at the executive level is men. Um, but really, I think taking a more, Intersectional approach requires looking beyond just representation. It's looking at things like what are the power dynamics, what are the dynamics in that in that country or in that culture or in society generally, and how do we break down some of those barriers and how do we make it so that women are not only able to participate in these spaces or participate in that employment. Like, yes, it is about, you know, ensuring their participation in um, making climate policy or participating in things like the UNFCCC meeting. 
but are you doing that and and how are you doing that in a manner that enables them to you know if they are the you know primary caretaker for children that those that like there there are steps being taken so that they're able to do that and not don't have to just be at home and so you have to address it in a more holistic approach i would say is is one of the important steps and to really sort of start breaking down um some of those systemic barriers and looking at ways to um, encourage the participation of women, including, you know, women who are the most marginalized of women, as well as in spaces where they maybe aren't able to have a voice. And so thinking about it truly from, from a start of participation, because if you have women at the beginning of if you're thinking about a climate project, if you incorporate women in their participation, and that's meaningful participation from the beginning because you've broken down the barriers to allow them from that, and so they're helping design that project, that project necessarily will probably be more beneficial to women and bring about gender equality because they've been involved from project design, can be involved throughout implementation, should then also be involved in monitoring and reporting and verification to make sure that it's all it's all integrated seamlessly and not just taken as a check the box. Yes, we had a consultation with women. Yes, 50% of the people at X consultation were women or 50% of this or 40% or whatever it is. Thank you, Erica. Oris indicated that he'd also like to speak. So the word is now yours, Oris. Well, I was first intimidated by the word concrete in your question because I was worried uh, whatever I could provide would be super abstract. But we do have one concrete proposal related to this in our report, which was that uh, even though Finland has had a fairly solid track record of supporting female negotiators from the global south, uh, what we proposed was to take that a bit further and uh, to focus that support to underrepresented women. Uh, uh, so looking at uh, women negotiators from the least developed countries, small island devel developing states, um, indigenous peoples, or, or youth, young uh, climate uh, negotiators, to make sure that not only you get a wider representation of women in these halls, uh, but also underrepresented group within uh, women. Thank you, Aris. Did we want? What, did one more person want to speak to this question? Yes, Axel. I can briefly comment. Um, so, w when it comes to um, gender mainstreaming and um, taking initiatives to uh, address that issue, um, all too often uh, women are seen as benefit takers, but as you mentioned um, they're often the leaders on the ground and often are the mo ones who can most efficiently um, take climate action. Uh, so that approach needs to be integrated that uh, not only uh, should they receive funding, but also it should be acknowledged that uh, they have the capacity and the leadership to actually utilize that uh, in the way that we need. Thank you, Axel. Uh, I'll turn to the audience now, as I saw there was some interest in asking some questions there. And I believe we have one more roaming microphone. We don't have an event assistant, so perhaps we can just leave the microphone at the front of the room. And if you would like to come and ask your question to the panel. And if there's any specific person you'd like to ask it to, then please address it to that person. Thank you. Um, my name is Rachel. I work for Generation Climate Europe, which is a youth organization in Europe. Um, and my question is about your understanding of gender, because a number of you have spoken about how you understand gender as more than women, which I think is great. But no one's spoken about... Everyone's spoken about men and women, and no one's spoken about people who are gender fluid or non-binary people or the trans community and how their experiences might be different or made more marginal. And I was wondering if you could expand a bit on that, because obviously it's incredibly important to think about these things. Yes, thank you for that question. Could I get an indication of who would like to speak on that one? I see Oris. Okay, you can start us off, Oris, and we'll see if anyone else, and then perhaps Erica or if someone else wants to hop in. 
It's a, it's a really important question. I think the challenge uh, uh, for us when we were writing that report was that there was so little mm -hmm. literature mm -hmm. available on the issue of gender identity or gender expression or non-binary people. Um, so there was very little to draw from uh, to, to write the report. And I think that's, uh, that would be the starting point, basically, to recognize that we don't fully understand uh, the role of, of gender minorities, trans people uh, play in this debate, and we would need to do more research, and we would, of course, need to have uh, their own voices represented in the discussions uh, to take those next steps about, you know, concrete measures. Um, there was one interesting uh, study by the Stockholm Environment Institute looking at um, uh, uh, LGBTIQ people uh, in terms of climate, uh, and I think uh, that was uh, a good uh, resource, but again, it was just one fairly small study. So I think we suffer from a, a lack of really uh, um, research and, and literature on this topic. And that's why I think uh, we in our study were not able to go very far because um, we didn't really have the resources for that. Thank you, Aris. I see that Erica and Axel wanted to speak. If Hannah Mari or Sarah also want to speak, I'll bring you in first since you haven't had a chance to answer. But otherwise, uh, we'll go with Erica first. I was going to go. I went first last time. So. Okay. okay, Axel, the word is yours. <laughs> Another brief comment. Uh, so I think it's a really important issue and something that I hear from a lot of youth in Sweden um, that we need to go beyond. Uh, this binary definition of gender um, and th th the main issue when I've been trying to find examples of how to uh, do that is just that there hasn't been any information and the reporting that's made uh, usually doesn't explicitly mention that. Um, so I think uh, one, the, the, the First and maybe most important step uh, towards addressing that is actually writing about it uh, when making reports, when making um, project proposals that actually mentioning that this is not only for uh, empowering men, uh, women as compared to men, but rather than uh, empowering people who, because of their gender, whether it be binary or non-binary, um, are marginalized. And I think that also relates to intersectionality that no matter what power structure uh, disenfranchises you, uh, empowerment is needed. Um, so I think it's a really important point. Thank you. And yeah, and, um, I'll maybe just add that I think it's, it's absolutely true um, and uh, definitely, I think that one of the things that needs to happen is also that on panels like this, we also need to think about the language we're using and what and and be more sensitive and and think about it. And um, I think I had it written down at one point and then totally lost it while I was speaking. Um, but I do think that it's important to think about it in when we're talking about it is to not limit gender to just women and men and to really speak about it as gender and speak about it as a spectrum and think about gender fluid people and and especially trans people in the LGBTI community and that it it encompasses so much more than just women and men. And I think that that's increasingly being recognized. And I think the other thing that um, can happen or one way to one way to start thinking about or doing it is to also not only study it and write about it, which I completely agree with, but also think about ways to integrate it into policies. And so when policies are being developed, for example, um, you know, at the Green Climate Fund, for example, or the Adaptation Fund, which has mandates around gender, and, and as they're developing gender policies or as they're developing environmental and social policies, to make sure that the ways that gender is being defined in those policies or the ways that you're defining and talking about communities or achieving these things are also integrating um, that aren't just saying women and men, that are integrating and taking a broader look at what gender means and that having those starting with the policies on paper then can also help lead to some of the changes on the ground and making sure they're then being implemented that way. And so when you're planning sort of for integrating gender, thinking through, you know, is this a space, is this a country where people who are trans are free to participate in project development? 
are free to be who they are? And, and how do you make sure that they're able to participate in project development? Can you create spaces as you're doing consultations to make their um, meaningful spaces for consultations? You know, do you have to have one that is specifically geared towards um, trans people or LGBTQI gender fluid people? And how do you make those spaces and how do you make them safe spaces for those people to participate in a in a way that that then will hopefully be reflected in a project that would benefit them um, and look that way? Thank you. Did you want to? Okay, one quick reflection, Sarah, before we take the next no. question. I, I also just wanted to make a short reflection. And, and honestly, frankly speaking, we are not there yet. We're just starting practicing the gender responsive approach. And I agree, it's not only about men and women. And, but we are practicing. We are, only, we are solely working with least developed countries and small island development states. And, and that's not an excuse. And then we are trying to. Um, promote having an inclusive approach. We are recently introduced indigenous peoples and aspects related to that. And that's uh, the newest, uh, you could say, aspect we are promoting. So we're not there yet, but we, we're trying. Thank you, Sarah. I hope that this answers your question. I'd like to see if there are any other questions from the audience. Yes, there's a hand at the back. Could you perhaps just come and collect the microphone? That would be fantastic. And again, introduce yourself, and then if your question is to anyone specific in the panel. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Rohit. Um, I work with Iglai Local Governments for Sustainability. I read the, uh, lead the energy work uh, globally. Uh, first of all, thank you to the panel uh, for this uh, wonderful talk and presentation that you have given on um, gender, mainstreaming gender. Um, my question first is to, is to Sarah. You talked about your work. Um, at, at the national level, on the countries. Uh, could you please uh, tell us who were the main or key stakeholders that you engaged in your work? And what do you think, is this something that we could do at the subnational level? Um, because cities, uh, local governments play a very important role in climate and energy action. And there, do you, how do you see the impact involving those key stakeholders? Uh, my second question is to uh, Anne-Marie uh, on finance. Um, you talked about carbon markets. I'm, I'm going to carbon markets also in general for finance. There's already a complaint from Global South that there is no finance flowing as per the Paris Agreement that should have been done annually for projects in general across thematic, energy, water, whatsoever. How do you see this helping or how do you see this resolving? Because unless we have finance for such projects, how do we then mainstream uh, you know, the gender issues? Third question to um, Erica. Uh, you talked about policies. Um, I mean, is the policies the only solution? How do you actually enact policies? Uh, is the way forward is where we can change social uh, or, or behavioral changes? How do we do that? Because in Global South, especially looking at Global South, there's so much uh, diversity in various regions of the part. The social fabric is so different. How do we do this? Um, and because we at Eclair are very much interested in mainstreaming uh, gender in our climate and energy projects, I want to learn and see how we can work together on this. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. I hope that we have time to get through all of them. We have about 15 minutes, and we'd also like to do a quick final round so that everyone has a chance to speak. But uh, we'll start with you, Sarah. We'll try and keep answers concise if we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for the question. The stakeholders represent, we say, a wide range of NGOs, academics, uh, different line ministries, etc. And the way we work, or that the national teams work, is that they establish working groups with representatives from these different uh, areas. But in addition, the, the national consultants also conduct stakeholder um, consultations. And I could give you the example from Liberia. The, the consultant for the coastal zone sector had identified, uh, together with the working group, a, a long list of technologies to protect the coastal zones. And um, based on that long list, the consultant went and actually uh, went to the communities along the coastal line and did uh, consultations. And actually, what came out of that was a different list of technologies that actually, in that sense, went back to the working group. They decided to go with this community-driven list of technologies and took that up for prioritization and further up in developing the technology action plans that are then again feeding into the NDCs. So it is this dual approach of having, okay, we have a set 
set list of, of experts that form the working groups. We do stakeholder consultations with, in this case, local communities, and that actually fed into and changed the priorities. And that came up for the you know, government endorsement and was taken up further on to the, the NDC. So, so that would be an impact of also involving the, the, the communities in that sense. I'll, I'll stop here as I've been asked to keep my response concise. And I would encourage you to look at our gender responsive guidance that actually um, explains how we've integrated it throughout the process. Thank you, Sarah. And I would also invite those who are interested and in, in able to stay afterwards that we could we could continue the discussion in the room next door. There is another event commencing in half an hour, but if you do have additional questions. Uh, Hannah Murray, I'll give you the word to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I will very quickly comment on the previous um, question because something came to my mind. Basically, the importance of language, um, because one thing that has been recommended is to have gender aggregated data as part of the monitoring. And of course, if you're only aggregating men and women, that's the data you'll get. So I think things like this can then really diversify the data as well. Um, and, and to really integrate it into the tools that then are used for projects. So I think there's opportunities to bring this up in the language so that then it's, um, it's sort of trickles down to the actual projects, but the language is really important uh, and it is a process and learning by doing. Um, in terms of the question, if I understood it correctly about carbon markets and how can we have these gender effects if we don't have the finance in the first place, if that was the right question, it is a good question, it's a big question and I don't think I will be able to answer that question. What I can say is that for carbon market finance to flow, um, and I don't know if, if the question was also about climate finance, not necessarily carbon market finance, but for carbon market finance to flow, there needs to be a trust in the carbon markets and trust in its integrity, but also social justice. And I would hope that that tools that show that carbon market can be used for beneficial things like gender um, equality can then increase its acceptability and desirability as a tool for mobilizing finance. But I acknowledge that doesn't solve the bigger finance issues. And um, I will have to say that I, I'm not able to comment more on how those bigger questions are, are resolved. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah Murray. Um, and then maybe just a, one minute to answer the last question, yeah. Erica. Um, I'll also start by saying on uh, Obviously, we need more financial flows, and I think there needs to be much more pressure put on governments to provide the finance that is needed because it is owed by the governments, and it is an obligation under the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement to provide that finance and support. And, and, and a key part of um, gender equality is also making sure that finance is flowing and that finance is flowing in the form of grants um, and not loans, and so that it's not leading to more debts, um, especially because that will also negatively impact um, gender um, and on uh, how you how you do it. I think policies are only the first step. I think one part of the importance of policies is that if you put it on paper and have it in policies, and then you can start working to uh, to integrate it and how that's integrated. I think there can be lessons that can be learned from um, places where it has started. So one, I think, is learning lessons from places where they've been able to do it right, whether that be some projects through the Green Climate Fund, some projects through the Adaptation Fund, but looking at looking at places um, that have integrated and mainstream gender well. And I think that one of the important parts of putting it in policies is that the more that it's in policies and is being mainstreamed and is being implemented by different actors in countries, the easier it is, I then think, for other countries and other actors to see that and see how it can be done and integrated um, in a manner. And so I do think it's it's only one small step, but is an important one to to make sure that, that people are considering it at all. Great, thank you. So we have about eight minutes left, and I'd just like to have one final question or a round on the panel so that everyone can have some final remarks. And in that, I'd like you to reflect based on, on the very broad expertise and experience that we have here in whatever way you think that it feels fit. If you could come with one suggestion for how the Nordics can follow up on this commitment that I mentioned at the beginning uh, of this discussion, which was 
uh, amongst other things, to promote international cooperation, alliances and advocacy on the interconnections between climate action and gender equality, and to develop and share knowledge, as well as internally committing to advance gender mainstreaming within green transition initiatives. So, very broad question, very broad expertise you all have, but it would be great to hear in this last round some suggestion that you may have. And I, I know you might need a minute to reflect on that, so I'll take it in whoever, I'll take it in the order of whoever would like to begin, rather than obliging someone. Okay, Oras, you can get us kicked off. Thank you. Well, uh, luckily our report does have a list of recommendations. I can uh, draw from that and not have to um, improvise here. Um, I think one thing that the Nordic countries could really do, and especially do it together, is to um, to kind of build an alliance for, for gender equality in international climate policy. And surprisingly enough, that kind of an alliance by governments doesn't really exist properly yet. There have been various initiatives, there have been different ad hoc things, but uh, what we have witnessed so far is that depending on the government uh, that a country has, they might be a bit active today and completely forget the topic tomorrow. And I think we would need some continuity and some commitment that uh, lasts over the years and, you know, pooling resources and getting progressive countries together uh, to really invest and commit to uh, uh, mainstreaming and integrating gender equality uh, into international climate policy. And there, there would be a natural role for the Nordic countries, I think. Thank you, Aris. Axel, would you like to continue? Yes. Uh, aside from increasing reporting and uh, having more funding specifically directed toward gender, I would say when actually doing those projects, um, they need to be suited to the local conditions and um, when giving out funding, it's important to not do it as a, a distant beneficiary, but rather be present on the ground, speak to the people who will actually implement. And uh, another important uh, aspect is, especially when it comes to energy um, initiatives, is um, not only having gender mentioned and mentioning that w what the goal is when, when it comes to um, how to gender mainstream, but also have clear action plans towards that. Um, the, the report I mentioned previously uh, highlighted that um, I think it was in um, uh, Zambia, maybe, that uh, Sweden had funded a, a project on solar panels, if I remember correctly, uh, which both um, aim to give sustainable electricity, but also at the same time, uh, by involving women locally, um, making them economically empowered, whereas other projects have been more... Um, haven't had a clear action plans, even if they had the intention of gender mainstreaming. There was no way there uh, specified. So I think those very specific spe steps to take need to be explicit. Thank you, Axel. Sarah, would you like to continue? Yes, uh, thank you, and I, I agree very much with uh, what have already been said. And I just wanted to add that one as aspect that I think we could do better with, both in the Nordic countries, but also then um, sharing that experience and sort of uh, throughout our work, is also the my experiences. We work with uh, consultants, with experts, with researchers, and we, we need to have the policies in place to facilitate that there's an equity in, in access and um, those who are, I'm, I'm talking about education here, because the experts we are working with, we can say, okay, we want a quota so there's an equality on who is represented, etc. But we also need, and I'm, I'm thinking with the, with the, in the forum I'm working with in developing countries, you know, it's very difficult to say we need an equal balance in the team if there are not enough experts available that could actually fill out those roles. So how can we um, create a system that also educates the people that are needed to take upon the roles that we see is, you know, would benefit the equal representation? And of course, we have uh, 
girls going into engineering, um, educational uh, aspects in, in Denmark, etc. And how can we actually also promote that uh, in the countries we're working with? So I think the policy, uh, policies are needed and we also need uh, awareness creation and to sort of go from the very early stages in the individual's life to create such conditions that actually makes uh, us all benefit from the educational opportunities that are there. Thank you. Who would like to continue? Erica? Yes? Sure. Um, and, and I agree a lot with what, what everyone has said before me. And I'll just add that I think one thing is to think about, um, you know, if you're promoting this truly in, in international cooperation, it's that it needs to make sure it, it needs to be reflected and promoted in multilateral spaces where I think it is often, um, where it often necessarily hasn't been. Like it, I, it, it hasn't necessarily been that you like, you know, when you're seeing the Nordic countries speaking in the halls of the UNFCCC or in um, the Green Climate, like I'm most familiar with the Green Climate Fund, where you would say, absolutely, one of the things they're promoting is gender mainstreaming. Um, and so I think that making sure that it's being reflected by actors and representatives of the Nordic countries in multilateral spaces and, and bringing that into those spaces and for them to be considering this commitment to gender mainstreaming when they're thinking about what, you know, what rules they're approving here at the UNFCCC, what policies they're approving, what projects they're approving in the financial mechanisms of, of the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement is, is, one, um, is one core way uh, to, to better make sure gender is mainstreamed. Thank you, Erica. I believe that Russell had to leave us early, so I don't believe that he is with us anymore. So that will mean that the final word on this question is yours, Hannah Mari. Thank you. And as Oras also, we worked on a report that had some recommendations, so I'll draw on those. So it's recommended that Nordic countries in their Article 6 piloting or their carbon market piloting specifically focus on how to use tools for the projects that they're working on uh, for gender equality and develop those tools. Um, so I'm wondering if Oras's uh, alliance could have a working group for the carbon markets, those actors who are interested in gender and not just Nordic countries, but the host country, the partner countries we're working on. So it would be an open alliance that would bring gender and carbon market people together. So that would be great and we would get them tools that we would develop together and then we would get positive real life examples that are very powerful when bringing these things to um, visibility as, as was mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah Murray. Thank you to all of our panel members. Thank you to those listening in the room and also online. Thank you to our technicians for supporting us through this event. We now must draw this event to a close as a new event will be starting in 15 minutes. But for those of you, um, I know everyone has busy schedules. For those of you who do have the time and the interest in continuing the discussion, uh, I would invite you to move into the room next door so that the next event can make an efficient start. So thank you once again, panelists and audience, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron.